stop your video right now. <laughs> I'll say that one more time. This is your disclaimer right now. Um, this will be posted on YouTube. Um, so if you do not want your screen being shared, scroll down to the bottom right now and hit stop video and that'll prevent that. Also, if you're having trouble with, um, with the streaming quality, if it's a little bit choppy, sometimes stopping your video will actually make it run a little bit smoother as well. So, so first off, scroll down to the bottom and you should see a, a chat box there. And why don't you just say hello in the chat there? Let us know where you're coming from tonight. Say hey to the crew. Um, awesome, glad you like the artwork behind me there. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, I'm up at the co-working office that I work out of tonight. So I uh, wanted to make sure I had a nice fast connection for tonight's call. Um, I'll just run through a couple of more logistics here. So we chatted about stopping your video and that this is being recorded. Um, I mentioned the chat there. Um, Sherry Ann is with us again tonight. Some of you are getting to know her uh, from Blue Jay Botanicals. Um, so if you see something posted in the chat from Sherry Ann, um, then it might be something that you want for your notes. Uh, Sherry Ann is going to be kind of sharing like videos and links and different things that uh, our special guest tonight, Christina, you and I reference as we go through. Um, so if you see something from Sherry Ann, take note of that. Uh, you also want to go check out Sherry Ann on Instagram at Blue Jay Botanicals. Um, she's been doing all kinds of cool live feeds around medicinal plants and uh, wild foraging and uh, really neat stuff about like the lore of plants and the history. And so if you're interested in getting to build a relationship with plants, uh, definitely check out uh, at Blue Jay Botanicals on Instagram uh, and you can look them up online. Uh, Sherry Ann, why don't you throw your link in the, the chat there where people can find more about uh, Blue Jay Botanicals. Um, I have everybody muted right now. So just know that you're not able to unmute yourself in this moment, but we are going to do a breakout group in a little bit um, where you're speaking with some of the other folks on the call tonight. So you will have an opportunity to chat uh, later on in the call tonight. Um, so just know uh, with this many people on, uh, it's just not super practical to allow, uh, allow people to unmute themselves. Um, what else do we want to chat about? Um, so this is a kind of an interesting night. A bunch of you have been joining in in this free series that we've run. We've had five of them over the last uh, few weeks. I've been doing one every Monday. And uh, this will be the last one in that kind of series uh, of calls. Uh, but just know that I am planning to do a bunch more. Uh, I've actually started lining up some new speakers. What I'm going to do is take a little bit of a break for the next few weeks and focus on our, our paid mentoring group, the, the Reading Nature's Forgotten Language group. Um, and once we kind of get up and running with that and it's going good, then I'll probably uh, announce some more dates, uh, likely starting maybe in March or, or if not April. Uh, and we'll keep going. I've really, really enjoyed this series. The feedback has been amazing and people are really enjoying it. So I'd love to keep it going. Uh, but I am going to just shift my focus for a little bit. Um, I also just want to say something to that group tonight. Uh, because we have uh, folks that are just tuning in for this call. We also have folks that are part of the, the Nature's Forgotten Language program. And this is your first live. We're calling them the virtual campfires that start tonight. So for folks that are in that group, we're going to be running one of these every other week for the next 12 weeks. So there'll be six of them to correspond with the six uh, lessons in the course. And just so you know, um, after this week's call, it'll just be our smaller group on these calls, uh, which will be kind of nice. It'll be a bit more intimate and it'll allow more time for kind of dialogue, uh, more time to get to know each other. Um, when we do our actual uh, calls with our group going forward, I won't have everybody muted. Um, so people can actually jump on and talk and ask questions. And uh, it'll be a lot, it'll be quite a bit different than how these calls go. For those of you that are not part of the paid group, um, there are still a few spots open. If you want to get in, uh, you can go to www.naturesforgottenlanguage.com. Um, uh, Sherry Ann will throw it in the, the link there, um, www.naturesforgottenlanguage.com. And if you enter tracks uh, for the coupon code, it'll get you 20% off that course, uh, the course. And then you can join in with us. Uh, and we'd love to have a few more people in that group if you're interested. Um, and this call is going to be a little bit different than the past living with the seasons calls. Uh, this will give you a little bit of a gauge of what the, the private group is going to look like tonight. Uh, it's a little more focused in some ways around really clear kind of objectives and learning. Uh, there are going to be some pretty heavy downloads, actually, a lot of, a lot of information coming your way. Um, and, and just know that the, the future ones will be a smaller group uh, and a little bit more interactive, as opposed to just our guests mainly, mainly kind of teaching for the group. Let me see. Um, I think hey, that's about, yeah. Sorry, um, I'm not able to send links for some reason. You're not able to post anything in the chat or post actively? I'm posting the links, but people, like you can't click them. Oh. No, that's a setting. Yeah, it probably is. And I'm not sure if I know how to change that in this moment. Um, 
I might be able to do that over the uh, when we go into the breakout group, Sherry Ann. I can play around with the settings. So for now, folks, with the, the links that Sherry Ann puts in there, you'll probably just have to copy and paste them and then put them into the URL browser. Um, I'll see if I can't get that fixed in a little bit. Um, so copy and paste it, put it in your URL or put it in your notes to, to pick up further. But sorry, the links aren't active right now. Uh, maybe we can get that uh, fixed a little bit later. Oh, you can't copy and paste either. Oh no, that's a little bit of a pain. Uh, okay, well, I'll look into that on the break anyways. I don't want to stop our flow right now. Um, oh yeah, one other thing just for folks joining the course, and then we'll we'll kind of officially start tonight's call. Um, so for folks that are part of the course, each call, Virtual Campfire, is going to correspond with one of the lessons. So tonight's Virtual Campfire corresponds with lesson one inside of the Nature's Forgotten Language course. Um, the following one will correspond with lesson two and so on. So for those that are following along, um, uh, that will help you there as well. So um, just a little piece of information there. Uh, I'll quickly just mention Christina Yu is in the house tonight. Oh, our special guest. Um, Christina, I'll do a more formal introduction to her in a, in a couple of minutes here, but she's going to be our guest uh, instructor tonight. And she's also going to be one of the, the regular instructors and mentors with the full course for people. So those that are in the program are going to get to know her quite well over the next little bit. So let's do, let's start off like we usually do most weeks. And I'd like to invite you to actually close your eyes for a second if you, if you feel comfortable for it. Uh, and we're just gonna take a moment to kind of shake off the road dust of the day, I'll say. So I'll invite you to, to find a way to just kind of sit comfortable. Maybe if your shoulders are a little bit tense, just let them relax a little bit. And start by just taking one or two really deep breaths, nice and slow in through your nose and out through your mouth. And as you do that, I invite you to just feel your whole body start to relax a little bit. Let go of all the busyness of the day. Let go of the to-do list. Let go of your worries and just bring yourself present in this moment. We're just going to forget about all that stuff for, for the next hour and a half uh, and have some really nice quality time together where we get to, to learn about nature and connect with the environment. So as you take your next breath, I invite you to imagine yourself out in your favorite place in nature. Maybe it's a local park, maybe it's a cottage, maybe it's a wilderness area. Maybe it's just sitting on your front porch or in your backyard or, or peering out a window at a spot you really love. And as you picture yourself in that spot, I invite you to tune into your senses as if, as if you're really there. Take a deep breath in through your nose and. What does it smell like right now if you were to be outside right now? Is it humid out or is the air dry? Does it feel cold as it comes in through your nostrils or does it feel warm? Can you feel a little bit of a breeze across your skin? Imagine if you were outside right now, what might the breeze feel like across your skin? Do you know what direction the breeze is even blowing from outside your door right now? And now in your mind's eye, keeping your eyes closed, just look around that spot as though you're there right now and just see your favorite spot out in nature. And feel how that makes you feel inside your body to just kind of relax and be present there. As we start our call tonight, I'd like to uh, bring nature into our awareness, all the many, many teachers and beings that support our lives. Uh, I'd like to just honor and offer gratitude for Everything from the, the organisms and the creatures that live in the soils, to the plants, to the tall trees, to the waters, to all the animals, the people, everything that supports our way of life, the ecosystem that we live in. Uh, you know, the things that without these, we wouldn't be able to survive and do what we do. The things that allow us to have food on our plates and warm our homes and move from place to place. I just want to hold all of those in our attention right now and, and feel the gratitude of what these things bring to us. And as we bring our gratitude and our awareness to the land, uh, I also want to bring my gratitude and awareness to the first peoples of this land, wherever it is that you live in the world. I know for myself personally, uh, my ancestors haven't been on this land where I live for very long. Uh, I have ancestors that came over from Hungary from England, 
from Scotland, all in my history and in my lineage. Uh, you know, that's a long, long ways away. And, and I know in my heart that uh, my people that came here wouldn't have been able to live here easily if it wasn't for information that was passed on and teachings and relationships that were built with the first peoples of these lands. So I wanna take a moment right now to just honor these, these ancient relationships and teachings and passings of knowledge that have happened between people and cultures for, for generations and hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of years that have allowed people to, to know the teachings to live uh, on different parts of the earth, uh, wherever it is you, you live. And for myself, uh, I wanna honor the, the first peoples of this land, the Anishinaabe where I live, uh, and specifically the Chippewas and the Mississauga peoples, uh, as well as the Huron and the Wendat, peoples and the Mohawk peoples, uh, the ancient peoples that lived on this land, as well as those that still live here today uh, and are still willing to, to share knowledge and, and receive and to, to be in relationships. And I know there's a lot of uh, healing and tending that needs to be done as far as relationships with first peoples uh, around the world and indigenous peoples. So I just want to hold that in our awareness as we come together tonight. And from there, I'd like to invite you to think about your own mentors, you know, uh, who are the people that have passed on knowledge or inspiration to you that has maybe led you to being here tonight? Um, I find often when we get into these spaces of people that really truly care about the environment, people who really truly care about their relationship with the land, there was often things as in our childhood or early adulthood that planted seeds that allowed us to be here. Uh, I bet you most of you probably have a mentor or two that have really influenced you in being the person you are today or on being on this call right now. So uh, I invite you just to hold that person or persons in your, in your mind and in your heart for a second right now and to honor them. And as I do that, I'll think about all my many, many mentors that have led to me being here. Hmm. And I guess last, I'll just honor the, the culture of mentoring. It's such a beautiful thing. Uh, the passing on of information, knowledge, inspiration between peoples. Uh, and again, where I live today here in, in the country that's now called Canada, uh, you know, there's cultures here from all over the world that have settled on this land now, uh, along with the first peoples that have been here uh, since the beginning of time. And I, I just want to honor the many, many different cultures of the world, because if we, no matter where we come from, where we live today, if we trace our ancestors back far enough, uh, we have ancestors that lived in real deep relationship with the land, that knew the skill sets that we're talking about tonight. Uh, that knew how to track, that knew the plants, that knew how to read the weather without a phone or a computer. Uh, all of us have that in our ancestry. Uh, and it's really beautiful to, to live in a world where we're actually to learn and hear and experience different cultures and the ways that they relate to the land. Um, so I just, wanna, I just wanna honor the many, many different cultures and their lineages that take them back to this, this ancient knowledge uh, in this moment right now. And I'll invite you to Take one more look around your sit spot right now. So you're sitting outside in your favorite spot. Take a couple more deep breaths and just take it all in. The sounds, the smells, the feelings. And slowly open your eyes and, and come on back into this room and join us here. It's funny, you know, people often give me feedback that I get talking so fast when I do these things. I get excited. You can, you can probably pick up that I'm a little bit passionate about these things. Uh, and every time I start with this, I just actually feel my voice slows down. Uh, I feel I sink into it. So I just love, you know, we are in front of a computer right now. I think a lot of us are probably spending more time than we'd like to in front of a computer these days. Um, so I'd like to just take this moment to actually bring nature inside and, and make this a different experience. You know, this is about community right now. Um, and we're still in an ecosystem. We're still in a habitat as we sit here uh, connecting with each other tonight. So I just want to call that in as we connect this evening uh, and bring our minds and our hearts together in a good way. So for tonight's call, um, we're going to tell a couple of stories to really paint a picture of where the, the, the skill set of tracking and natural awareness can kind of take you in your relationship with the land and your ability to interact with it. Uh, and then we're going to dive into some lessons in, in reading the landscape. Uh, we're going to kind of deliver our first couple of lessons around starting to learn how to be a tracker uh, and read the story of the land and interpret the signs and the sounds. Uh, Christina Yu has some really fun uh, natural mysteries that she's brought on. So she's going to share some slides and some pictures and we're going to break out into some breakout groups. Um, 
And then after that, we're going to actually do some teachings around some track patterns. And we're going to leave you with a challenge to go out and find some of these track patterns out on the landscape. And we set this up that they should be able to be completed in any ecosystem. So whether you live in a big city or whether you live in, you know, the Arctic or out in Alaska in the middle of the wilderness in the mountains, uh, it should be applicable anywhere, the lessons that we're going to dive into to tonight. <laughs> um, now I want to share, so I'm going to share two stories right off the bat, and then I'm going to pass it over to Christina Yu. We'll do a little bit of introduction to her, and then we'll carry through with that plan. So the first story is actually not so much a story about tracking, but uh, I just want to acknowledge something about this course just right off the bat. I've decided to actually change the name of the course, Reading Nature's Forgotten Language. Um, and I wish I decided this six months ago or eight months ago because I've invested quite a bit in the branding, in the videos, in the workbooks, uh, and now I need to redo a bunch of it. But I think it's important that we, we speak to this really quickly uh, right now. So when I first came up with the name Reading Nature's Forgotten Language, I was really excited about it because to me, you know, there was just this idea of great mystery in the name, you know, uh, this idea of possibilities uh, of relationship and, and human potential in the name. So we went along and we started creating all the content and we made the logo and, you know, did the fun intros and all of that kind of stuff. And then it started sitting a little bit funny with me and I started thinking, you know, uh, I'm calling this Nature's Forgotten Language, but this language isn't actually forgotten at all. You know, there's people all over the world that still do hold this language. So that's one thing I started thinking about. And I started thinking, man, is this is this kind of funny that I'm I'm trying to sell this course uh, and calling it a forgotten language as if I have some sort of key to this ancient knowledge and that you have to come through me to get it. And that actually didn't really sit right with me when I started kind of thinking about that. Uh, I don't call myself an instructor or a teacher. I call myself a mentor. Um, I've got, I'm always learning myself. And that's the one thing I love about these calls and the way we do the courses that we're actually learning together. Uh, and I have a skill set around mentoring. Uh, I don't by any means have the key to something that's not accessible unless you come through this course. So that part started feeling a little bit weird to me. And, and I was wondering if it was even a little bit disrespectful to the many peoples and cultures that this is actually a part of their way of life in, in calling it a forgotten language. The second part that came up, and ironically, this just happened the other day. Um, so I was chatting with a, a good friend of mine who is the Nishinaabe background. Uh, and she said to me, it, it's kind of funny the way this went, because I was already thinking, I don't know if I like the name, but I've put so much into creating this course. And she says to me, hey, Chris, I want to chat with you about the name of the course. And instantly I was like, oh, no, I totally know where she's going with this. And, you know, I don't want to bring a lot of politics into this course. It's not my intention at all. Um, but she straight up said to me, she's like, are you, and she, she brought it in the most respectful way. I really appreciated her approach, but she came to me and she said, Hey, Chris, um, are you okay if I, if I share my thoughts on the name of the course? And I'm like, uh, I would I absolutely. And I, I feel like I already know what you're going to say, but please do so. And, and what she had shared. So from, and I'm kind of quoting her here. Um, she said, you know, for my people, uh, we didn't forget this language. It was actually taken from us. Uh, it was stolen from us. Um, and many things happened to our culture that changed our relationship with the land and brought us to a place that this wasn't part of our daily lives anymore. Um, and, and that's why a lot of my peoples maybe don't have this skill set and knowledge today. Um, and when you say that it was forgotten, to me, it feels like that that doesn't actually um, tell the truth of the story with my people specifically. Um, and you know what? My response to her was absolutely. I mean, I already knew that. Um, and as you say that, I, I completely respect your opinion on that. And, you know, when I think about it, actually, in regards to my own ancestry, going over to Hungary, going over to Scotland, uh, if you track my story back far enough, I've spent an extensive amount of time looking into it. It's, it's the same story for my peoples. It was just a lot further back in time. Um, but my peoples were, were colonized in a similar way where this knowledge was kind of taken from us as well. Um, so having her brought that up and having the pieces that I was already thinking as it relates to this, um, even though we've invested a bunch of money and all of this stuff, we're, we're going to actually change the name of the course. Um, I'm, I'm not changing it overnight. It's going to stay at the name of the course probably for the next 12 weeks. But one thing I thought might be kind of fun for those of you in the course is maybe we'll do some sort of contest or something to try and come up with a new name for the course um, and then rebrand it. And then when uh, I launch the next cohort uh, later this year, it's going to come out with a new name. So again, you know, I don't intend to bring a lot of politics into this course, but at the end of the day, you know, politics are, are relevant. And um, as we dive into this realm of connection and land, I think it's just important to be, you know, transparent about some of these pieces. And I think there's some good teachings in some of that, you know, 
Um, so I hope uh, I hope everyone understands where I'm coming uh, from there. And I appreciate you for just hearing me out there tonight. Uh, it felt really important to me to kind of share that with our group right now. So. OK, so I'm going to tell a story right now. I'm going to share my screen and uh, we're going to dive into a really fun tracking lesson. So this story. Um, this story really impacted my life, actually. I, I would even say that it changed my life. So this is going back probably close to 15, 20 years ago. And um, it was when I was first diving into the skill set around tracking. And I was really excited. You know, I was buying field guides and I was going out and IDing prints. Um, and I was just kind of getting this point where I was realizing that there was actually stories written in the, uh, the prints on the ground. Um, and that when you follow prints, there's an immense amount of detail. And the better you learn at kind of reading those stories, the more, geez, just the more profound the experiences start to become outside. So I'm going to share a slide and walk you through an experience I had out on the land. And there's actually some teachings in this story here to help you start to do the same thing and reading these patterns. So give me a second here. Um, is that the one I want? Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen here. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen OK. All right, great. So you can see there's two colors here. There's the blue and the green. The blue is me, and the green equals the deer. So I'm walking down a trail, and it happened to be in a habitat that was super sandy. And I'm out for a cruise one day, and all of a sudden, I see a beautiful doe, and she's walking straight towards me. And we have this really interesting moment where the doe stops, and up until this point in my life, almost every time I'd seen a deer in the wild, uh, we'd see each other and then the deer would run. I'd seen a lot of running deer or I'd catch them, you know, like on the edge of a farm field or something where they just don't care because they're feeding and they're used to people. But a lot of my experience was with deer running away. But what was really interesting on this experience is I stop, I see the deer, the deer stops and looks back at me. And instead of running away, she stomps her foot and she lets out this really loud wheezing sound. And then she stomps her foot a couple more times and then she wheezes again. And this goes on for, I don't know how long, a minute, maybe two minutes. And then she chooses to run away. And I have this moment of like, I was almost scared because I'd never heard a deer wheeze at this point in my life or snort like that. I'd never had a deer be aggressive towards me. And in my mind, I'm like, oh my goodness, why, why did she do that? Like, that's not normal. That's not what I'm used to. Um, so I get thinking about it and I walk over and I go and I look at her tracks and now I'm going to kind of tell this story through two kind of lenses. Cause what I realized is this incredible story unfolded between me and her interacting. And if let's say Christina, you, or one of you were to walk along and to come across my footprints, let's just say that you're following me down the trail and you come along and you notice that I stopped and then I'm paying attention to something. And then you walk forward and you notice the deer that the entire story piece by piece was actually written in the ground like a storybook and that a good tracker could actually pick up all of this information and this entire story as though um, we weren't even there or sorry, without even being there, she'd be able to get the, the minute details out of the story. So let's walk through it. The two patterns you see on there right now, they're what we call a diagonal walk. And it's the way that humans normally move, being two-footed, right? Our foots kind of stagger as we walk. Well, deer walk the exact same way, except in each one of those prints, there's going to be a front and a back foot, but you still get that diagonal pattern. Dogs do this as well. Cats do this as well. It's the common way they move across the landscape. Now, what's interesting here, let's actually say that you are, imagine yourself out, you're following a deer trail right now, and you're following this diagonal pattern. And all of a sudden, you see two footprints side by side. Well, in tracking, uh, whenever we see a break in the pattern, we know there's a story. There's a reason. Stuff's not random in nature. It happens for a reason. So in this case, you're walking along following the deer. And all of a sudden, it switches from this diagonal to two feet side by side. And you say, huh, what happened here? Wow, it looks like the deer stopped. Interesting. There's two footprints side by side. And it probably stopped for a little while, because if a deer is just stopping for like a second or two, it's probably just going to leave its feet staggered. But if it's actually stopping for a little while, it's more energy efficient and comfortable to bring those feet side by side. So this is actually the pattern that day on the ground, you could find the exact moment where the deer stopped. 
So we call that a break in baseline. And if you look at this here, imagine that you're following the deer and you can see those two side by side, and then it goes back to the walk again. You would know, okay, the deer stopped because of this one pattern I saw on the track right here. Now, what's interesting enough, what happened that day is I stopped too. And because I stopped for a long period of time, I brought both my feet together. So again, you're the tracker walking along and you find, okay, the deer stopped and you're like, okay, well, it appears to be looking forward. So let me walk forward a little bit and see if I can find any more clues. As a tracker, we're being detectives. So you walk forward and you find the person and you're like, oh, isn't this interesting? The person stopped too. Now I've got a hypothesis that I know the exact moment in time that the person saw the deer and the deer saw the person. It's actually written in the landscape without me being there. Now, the next thing that happens is the deer starts to stomp her feet and snort. So now you're a tracker and you're looking at all of these tracks and you have a cluster and they're deeper than the tracks were where she was walking. And there's a whole bunch of them side by side. Well, now the tracks are actually telling you the emotional state that the deer was in when she made these tracks. Super powerful moment right now, right? You actually are tracking the emotions of the deer by the pattern she left in the soil. And not only did she show some emotion, she was angry. You could ask the same question that I asked for real that day and say, well, why didn't she just run away? Why did she actually take time to stomp and be aggressive instead of just running? Now you have a mystery and having a mystery is where the fun in tracking really starts. You know, answers are boring. You know, you get an answer. It's like, okay, cool. That happened. Now what? Go on about my day, read the newspaper, go watch another TV show. But when I don't know the answer, when I don't know what happened, it becomes exciting because now it's like, well, I got to figure that out. I got to be a detective. So going back to my story, on that day, the deer runs away and I decide to actually walk a bit of a zigzag pattern and see if I can find any more clues in piecing out the story. And just notice for a second there, uh, notice how the pattern changed. We had that diagonal pattern as the deer came in, but now we got this pattern where you have kind of two staggered feet and then two side by side and then a space in between them. That's kind of our classic bounding pattern that tells me the animal's running away. So um, just, just notice that pattern for a second there. So now the blue line is me and I start doing the zigzag pattern and I get down to the corner of the screen there. And sure enough, there is, um, you know what? I'm just gonna move this chat. I'm not sure what it's showing up for you, but the chat's actually blocking um, my ability to see it. So I'm gonna just move it to the other side or sorry, the screens of people's pictures. Hit play again here. So down in the bottom right of the screen now, this is what I actually came across that day. I come across these beautiful little fawn tracks and the fawn, exact same pattern. She's in the diagonal walk. And what's interesting, notice what's at the bottom of the fawn track, two footprints side by side. So what happened? The fawn stopped. So now as a tracker, I can actually piece it together and say, well, when did the fawn stop? I wonder if she stopped when she heard the mum snort. And suddenly I've got one uh, answer to my question. It's like, oh, cool. So the mama, the reason she didn't run away was because she had a fawn. She snorted and stomped to actually alert her fawn and to buy some time for her fawn to actually get away and hide. And by looking at the tracks here, I can actually find the exact moment in time where the fawn heard her mom because the fawn stopped and she put her two feet side by side to listen. Now, what happened after that? Well, I'm just pointing there is the fawn runs away. And I, so I actually go and trail the fawn. I start following the fawn tracks through the forest. And sure enough, I find a spot where the fawn actually laid down in some dense brush. And now I'm gonna form a second hypothesis here and say that I'm gonna guess that about the time when mama decided to run away was probably pretty close to that moment in time when the fawn actually hid. Mama knows fawn is safe, now she's gonna run away. So mom ran in one direction and then sneakily stalked back over to where the fawn was. And I found the moment where they united again. So this whole story was really, really neat to experience. But beyond that, what was amazing for me, and this is the part that was really life-changing for me and like such a big epiphany was to realize, so I just witnessed all of that. I just tracked this whole story. It was a really cool nature connection experience. The light bulb was, I didn't have to be there to know everything that happened. That entire story, detail for detail, was actually written in the sand I was in that day. And it was this moment where suddenly life was changed and tracking became a whole new thing to me. It wasn't about identifying prints on the ground anymore. It was actually being a storyteller about the story of nature and the story of life. And it was so empowering for me to have that experience that day. So um, 
I'm just gonna see, do I have another slide there? I don't. So I'm gonna stop my screen share there. Give me one second. And uh, just leave that as a story with a little bit of inspiration tonight as to you know where we go, where the art of tracking can actually take us. Tracking is about so much more than just identifying footprints. It's about reading the story of life. And I just shared a story in the footprints, but there's also stories in the weather. There's stories in the trees. There's stories in the plants. There's stories in the bird calls. Uh, and that's why you know the original name of the course, Reading Nature's Forgotten Language, was the idea that there's this language around us all the time. And myself, you know, I was in my 20s and was clueless to all of that being around me. And it wasn't until I came across a couple of mentors um, that I realized um, that there was all this stuff happening right in front of me and I was oblivious to it. And it became my lifelong journey to, to dive in and relearn uh, this, this ancient way of relating to the land. So I'm gonna leave my story there tonight as a little bit of an inspiration piece as to where we're gonna be going in the, the coming weeks with this course, as far as interpreting the land. Uh, and there was a couple of lessons in there. If you can start to remember those patterns and, and even just track how I was able to put that story together. Uh, and maybe that's something you can think about next time you're following an animal out on the landscape and, and thinking about your experience. So I'm gonna pass it over to Christina Yu right now um, and have her do a bit of an introduction to herself and, and share some stories as well. Um, maybe I'll just say a couple really quick things about Christina Yu here. Uh, first, I just want to say that it, it's such an honor to have her on the class. Um, she's, she's great. <laughs> she really is. Christina Yu actually came to one of the first survival courses I ever taught. Uh, I think it was around 2008, 2009. Um, and she sat in a, a tracking lecture that I taught in that course, along with all kinds of other survival skills. And what I appreciated about Christina is she started showing up to everything. And beyond just showing up to everything, it was clear that she actually was practicing stuff in between classes. And for any of you that work as mentors and teachers, you, you might know, or, or my experience at least, is that's actually fairly rare. You know, um, a lot of people come to classes, they're really inspired, they say, oh my goodness, this changed my life. And then when they leave, they don't actually apply a lot of it. Um, and Christina Yu was clearly actually applying a lot of this to her life. So whenever students do that, it stands out in my mind. And we started to build a relationship over time. Uh, we became friends. It went beyond just being teacher-student to the point that we started hanging out outside of this, uh, outside of courses and stuff like that. And she's developed an incredible skill set around tracking, among many other things. Um, and she also works in uh, a mentoring as well. She's a martial arts instructor. So I was super excited to, um, to ask Christina if she would join us for the Nature's Forgotten Language course this year. So she's gonna be one of the other mentors for the experience. Uh, you'll get to know her, those of you that are in the course inside of the community. She'll, she's already been in there commenting on people's pictures, making her own posts. So I'll just leave it there and pass it over to Christina Yu to share a little bit about your background. Oh, the one other piece I just wanna add to that that I think is really fascinating. So I, I live in the North Country. Um, I live in a wilderness setting, you know, I can walk out my back door and see bears and moose and wolves. Um, and sometimes I think when people hear stories like that, it's like, that's really cool, but like, it feels inaccessible. And one thing I love about having Christina in this program is that Christina lives in Toronto. She lives in a high rise apartment building in Toronto. She learned all of these skills. She didn't have, my, um, and, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but my uh, dad used to bring me canoeing. I was a Boy Scout. I had nature mentors growing up. I'm, I'm not sure that Christina had a lot of nature mentors or not, but my understanding is she didn't. So she actually sought out this knowledge on her own and she did it in an urban environment. Um, so that, that's really inspiring me to me as well. And that was partly why I asked her to be an instructor for the course um, is just so that people see that, that this skill set can be developed in any ecosystem. And even if you don't have mentors in your life to help you to get there. So without any further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Christina. Come on on. Thanks so much, Chris. Can you hear me? Excellent, you can hear me. Okay, well, I'll try to live up to all those wonderful words Chris just said. Uh, all joking aside, it's really an honor to join you on this course as a co-mentor, um, as Chris mentioned. My name's Christina. Chris and Christina, it's the perfect name for a tracking course. Chris and Christina, go look at stuff. Yeah, I think that should be our new name. So, uh, as I said, yeah, he's cheering me on. Um, it's just so nice to see so many familiar faces on here too. Uh, to the mentoring group online, hello. Uh, it's nice to meet you face to face. Um, it's, I'll just tell you a little bit of my story uh, coming into tracking. Um, I'll try to keep it short because he, he gave me five minutes. So we'll see, we'll see if I can make it. 
Um, so just give me a moment. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Here we go. Share and share. Here, share. Okay. Can you guys see this? Yes, you're giving me a thumbs up. Excellent. All right. Let's see if I can run the show. So um, I grew up in Coldwater, Ontario. If any of you guys live in Southern Ontario, you'll know that that's a town of less than a thousand people. Um, it had one stoplight, uh, but it was a rural area. And so I grew up kind of sort of in a nature rural-ish um, environment. But just like Chris said, I didn't have a lot of nature mentors growing up. Um, you might have noticed I'm Asian. Uh, I'm second generation. I, my parents are from Hong Kong, so an extremely urban area. And when we moved to Coldwater from Toronto, um, there, was, there was a lot of shoving us out into the backyard to play, but certainly no awareness of what's this species of tree? What's this species of bird? What's this animal? And no, nothing about tracks. Um, we were really lucky. We had a lot of friends who were aware that, you know, we're new here. We're new, fairly new to the country in some ways and also new to this village. Um, and so we were, able to get some time at cottages, uh, maybe once a year. People would take us on ski uh, out across lakes to visit, visit them at night. Um, we were being invited to people's places for dinner. So we got to see a lot of the countryside. Uh, but like I said, not a lot of awareness of what was going on there. Um, nature is out there. We're here, very much tourists in our own village. So as time went on, um, I should back up a little bit. I'm a very imaginative person like I have a very hey, strong Christina sorry yeah. the, the screen is blank right now it's just showing white is there supposed to be something up hold on click oh look <laughs> it's That's coming better. up oh stuff all right sweet so um yes it is supposed to be blank you ruined my surprise Chris no I'm just kidding <laughs> um so as time went on uh I'm, I'm a very imaginative person I grew up watching a lot of like those adventure movies reading The Hobbit uh, really thought of adventure and the wild as a very romantic kind of thing, like the forest, it's out there, the wilderness, it's out there. You know, David Attenborough informed a lot of my ideas of what um, wildlife should be like, that it's remote and you have to go pretty far away to find it. Um, so um, it took me quite a while before I kind of built up the courage to go out into the wilderness to try to find adventure of my own. So this photo you're seeing is the first uh, adventure I took. It's a dog sledding course. Chris was my instructor. Look at that giant beard, that giant beard on his face. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so uh, he was one of the people on that course and I had a wonderful time. Uh, it was without rebound. And um, at the end of the course, he just kind of mentioned in passing, hey, I'm gonna be starting up my own wildlife, uh, I shouldn't say wildlife, outdoor education company. And if you're interested, you should come. And so I did. And uh, I, I took this course in Powering Ancient Ways it was kind of like this smorgasbord of outdoor skills. And there was like a little bit of fire, a little bit of plants, a little bit of tracking, and you kind of got to pick which ones interested you best at the end of it. It was a really big survey. And at the end, you know, some things caught our imagination and some things didn't. For me, tracking really did catch my imagination. I had read about it for a long time and I really did want to learn more about what these imprints on the ground meant and how to interpret them. And so that really, that really, um, that really caught hold of me. Um, so fast forward a couple of years, uh, I, I kept trying to find tracking courses, uh, but I wasn't really successful. There was such a thing as um, a tracking club in Toronto, uh, but it really didn't advance past the beginner level. Um, there was such a thing as a tracking workshop that I took with my very good friend, Bill. Uh, but again, like fairly beginner and it kind of dropped me back at home with the same problem I had growing up, which is wilderness is out there, I'm here in the city, how do I get from here to there to track? And so I, I kind of spun my wheels for a little bit. Um, but eventually after, you know, talking to a lot of people about how I'd really like to go tracking, someone pointed me to uh, White Pine Program's week-long Algonquin tracking course. Uh, some of you might have heard of that and some of you might not have, but um, uh, Dan Gardoki from White Pine, he, he ran this immersive like week-long stay. You'd stay in these cabins in the middle of Algonquin Park and he'd take you tracking every day. And like meals were included, it was so wonderful. The food was great, the company was even better. And at the end of it, I was just feeling so inspired, like just so um, motivated to learn more about tracking. It had like really skyrocketed 
uh, my learning curve. But again, Algonquin's out there. I'm here in the city. I don't know who to track with. Fast forward another couple of years. Um, some of you are here from the Living with the Seasons courses with Alexis Burnett. Um, Alexis runs a company called Earth Tracks. And way back in, oh, I don't know, it would have been like 2000, 2013 maybe, um, he says, hey, Christina, I'm thinking of putting together this thing called a tracking apprenticeship. It's gonna be 10 weekends a month, uh, no, pardon me, 10 weekends for 10 months. Uh, we're gonna meet all year round. We're gonna learn about tracking. Hey, are you interested? And you know, kind of hemmed and hawed. I was like, ah, this, is, this, this seems like a really good opportunity, but it's gonna be so hard. I don't have a car. And uh, my, my very good friend, Bill said, if you do it, I'll do it. So we both signed up the next day. Um, so we enrolled in this tracking apprenticeship, 10 weekends, 10 months. Uh, we were out in all sorts of seasons and we did all sorts of things that you're gonna be experiencing here if you're part of the Nature's Forgotten Language course. Uh, we learned about identifying tracks. We learned about gates and track patterns. We learned about ecology and aging. We learned about pressure releases and plants. Uh, it really ran the gamut. And uh, we spent a lot of time out there, you know, sniffing tracks, sniffing scat, staring at tracks, measuring tracks. We stuck our heads in holes, measured the holes, smelled the holes. It was a good time. And then at the end of it, after doing a lot of journaling and a lot of homework, uh, I got a certificate. I graduated as Alexis's first tracking apprentice. So that was a really big deal. It was pretty awesome. Um, and at the end of that time, uh, he said this tracking evaluation, uh, again, with Living with the Seasons, you might have heard from Lee. Uh, Lee talked about something called the cyber tracker evaluation. Well, I got to take that with her when she went as the evaluator. And um, so I graduated with a level three. Uh, so did Chris, I believe. And there's Laura. There's Chris up here and there's Laura. And here's my other tracking instructor, Skeet, and he was there. And here's Alexis. So we all as, went as this big group and it was like absolutely thrilling. It was just so cool to have a really, really skilled tracker evaluating um, our processes and giving us direct feedback right on the spot. So that led to other opportunities. Um, I went to the Northeast Trackers Conference with my friend Lee that was in uh, Massachusetts. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I started my own tracking club. This is Big Smoke Trackers if we uh, run out of the GTA. And um, it's just been like a really great journey to go from an absolute beginner living in the middle of nowhere and knowing nothing about the outdoors to now having like um, opportunities to teach my friends about tracking and to co-teach, well, to co-mentor with Chris and to, to look at stuff on the ground and say, you know what, I, I think I know what happened here and, and let's go exploring. If I think, about this idea that the wilderness is out there and it's not here where I am. I, I really have to say that that actually is false. If I go outside and I pay attention, um, there's some really beautiful things everywhere I look. Like this was just in a strip, a strip field, just like an empty waste parking lot um, next to a strip mall. This was in my parents' backyard. It's a uh, father cardinal feeding its baby. This is chicken of the woods. It's one of the most sought after edible mushrooms. This was in Queens Park. This is a red-tailed hawk. It's nested for several years in a row just outside of my building where I work. And this is split gill. It's a fungus that is currently being researched for its potential to consume and break down plastic. So um, you don't have to go to the Amazon like David Attenborough did in order to find something wondrous and gorgeous. You can just walk out your door and find something incredible if you just pay attention. And so that's what tracking means to me. It's seeing the beauty by, uh, in the world by paying attention. And I'll give that back to Chris. How do I stop screen share? Oh yeah, this sometimes it can be kind of part. hard to find the, the stop share. You gotta scroll up or down. You see it there? Did it. All right, let's wait till it comes Yes. <laughs> awesome. 
So beautifully told, Christina. That was that was great. Thanks so much for sharing there. Uh, that was that was wonderful. <laughs> Just looking in the chat there. Awesome. So, anyways, that, that's Christina Yu. So you can now see by her story that she is indeed awesome. Uh, she just validated my point there. <laughs> okay. So let's let's chat a little bit about starting off on this this process of wonder and exploring and and tracking and getting to the ability to start to read these these amazing stories that are on the landscape all around us. And we we've kind of already shared, you know, in my story there, I shared that you know the question. You know, in, in Western education, and, and maybe this is not actually a fair or accurate judgment, um, but you could kind of say that sometimes, you know, the goal is the answer um, in, in Western education or modern education, where I would say in tracking, it's actually the opposite. The goal is the next question, because the next question is what causes us to keep learning and causes us to keep evolving and causing us to keep growing. So a huge part of the art of tracking uh, is actually about the art of questioning. And the better our questions become, um, the more our learning becomes and the more our relationship with the natural world around us grows. I'm going to share um, a video right now um, from, and I hope the stream's okay. This is, I'm going to just play this off of YouTube. It's pretty short. So uh, I apologize. Sometimes when I try to stream videos, um, they can be a little bit choppy or not come through perfect for folks. So if you can't hear it or it's being kind of funny, uh, it's only like a minute, minute and a half long. Uh, so I'm going to do my best anyways. There's just a quick little disclaimer there. But this is this is a really beautiful video. So we'll we'll chat about it in just a moment. So give me another second. Um, okay, I'm going to go full screen here. And I'm going to hit, oh, where do I hit? How do I hit play? Okay, so here we are. We've come across another set of tracks here, and I just want to talk briefly a bit more about what I called the sacred question um, in the last segment. And <clears throat> I noticed a little disturbance in the sand, which originally drew my attention here, and I came up to these, um, these orange berries, as you can see, and there's a bunch of berries displaced. So I asked myself, what happened here? Oh. And what can I learn from this? And as I look down, I can see that there's clearly some raccoon tracks. A raccoon had walked up through here, and this, there's a couple. Hey, let me pause. I'm going to see if I can't turn the volume up here. A couple people have mentioned that, um, that maybe it's a little on the quiet. Ah, uh, oh, sorry. No, it doesn't look like I can turn the volume up too much more, folks. So we'll just go back there. We're going to debrief it in a moment anyways. So behind tracks here where the raccoon is, has come up on its haunches and actually eaten the berries off of these, um, off of this shrub right here. And some of the berries have fallen down. And when I look at the berries, I pick them up and I also ask myself, well, when was this raccoon here eating these berries? And I can see that there's a lot of small little sand particles that are attached to the berry, which tells me that these berries were wet when they fell down to the sand, into the sand on the beach here because all of the sand particles have it adhered to the berry. So knowing that it hasn't rained that much here, uh, but we're getting really heavy dews, there's a really good chance that this raccoon came across at nighttime, and that's when it was feeding on the berries and they fell, knowing that they would have been covered in dew, as well as knowing a little bit about raccoons and their, their habits, and they like to come out at night. So just continuing to ask these questions, you know, what happened here? What can I learn from this? Um, and I can bring all of this information in, um, into my awareness by asking these questions. So always asking questions, it leads to many, many mysteries and answers that come. Okay, I'll stop my share there. Could you hear at least, can some people hear it a little bit? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, sorry about that. I couldn't actually turn the volume up much more. But I thought that was an amazing experience right there. So me and my friend Alexis Burnett there, uh, that's Alexis who Christina referenced that runs the, uh, the tracking apprenticeship. Uh, you can check out Earth Tracks. Where does that bird sound coming from? Right now we're at this oh. edge, this border zone. Hold on, YouTube's uh, playing in the forest, background, hilarious. Off. Sorry about that. Uh, how do I get back? Okay, where's the meaning? Oh, sorry about that. I'm back. Uh, YouTube didn't stop in the background there. This is what happens when you take a, a bush guy and put him in on front of a computer. So anyways, we'll carry on here. Um, nice. James even knew who it was, though, a wren. That's great. Props to James on, on, on naming the bird there. 
we can always be learning, right? Even in those weird moments. So, <laughs> um, anyways, okay. So back to the story there. So I'm walking down the beach with Lex, and did you notice the first thing that he notices? Like we can't see animal tracks. There's literally like this patch of sand, and there's like a patch that's you know a little bit bigger than my head, that's a little bit brighter in color than the sand around it, but not even a lot, like just a touch. And Alexis just like zones in, like boom, there's something there, and he walks over. Uh, and right off the bat, it's just like, you know, how many people would notice that? Um, and, you know, five years ago, there's no way I would have, you know, I would have walked right past it too. So we go walking over to this little patch of sand that's just a slightly different color. And he goes right into the art of questioning. And it's like, okay, cool. What's going on around here? Oh, look, there's some footprints. And we identify that it's a raccoon, you know? And we could have just left it right there and said, okay, cool. Well, there's a raccoon. That's why there's disturbance there. But then Alexis starts looking at the actual pattern in the gates and he says, oh, this is interesting. Look, there's two back feet and they're side by side. Uh, I wonder if it was standing up. So the raccoon stands up and it's clearly taking the berries off this tree. There's a whole bunch of berries that have fallen. We can see how the raccoon stood up. Again, we could just leave it there, you know? Oh, cool, that was kind of neat to see a raccoon. It was feeding on berries. But then the next question comes up and Alexis says, well, I wonder when it was eating on the berries. And I thought this was my favorite part of that whole video. So what he actually does, I don't think he showed in the video, he takes a berry off of the bush and he drops it into the sand. And then he picks it up to see if the sand, sand sticks. And sure enough, there's no sand on it. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. Because when I pick up these other berries, the sand sticks to it. But the berry I drop in fresh right now, this is the middle of the afternoon, it's sunny, it doesn't stick. And he's like, hey, this tells me that the berry was moist when it fell into the stand. So now I think in my head, well, when was the last time that there was humidity in the air? This must have happened last night when the humidity was higher and there was moisture on the berries. So now just asking these questions leads to just this really elaborate story. And now we know when the raccoon was coming through the landscape as well. Um, so I really thought that it's just such a beautiful video around how something like as benign as this little patch of sand on the side of the beach that most people wouldn't think anything of um, when you start to ask good questions and be curious, suddenly there's an entire story in there. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that video. So I'm going to share a couple slides with you right now. Let's see, we're going back here. And we're just going to chat a little bit about the art of questioning. And then I'm going to pass it over to Christina to share a little bit more and then share some mysteries for the night here, or natural mysteries of the night. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to hit play. Well, I'm going to move this. Okay, so one way to approach, I mean, there's lots of ways to approach the art of tracking. Um, and one framework that's helpful when we're starting out is just what we call the five W's. You know, so the first question we can ask is who made the track? And for those of you in the, the Forgotten Language course, we're going to dive into this in great depth because there's a lot more questions I can add to the who that help us actually start to narrow down from like hundreds of possible animals or maybe dozens of possible animals to like two or three possible animals or even one animal. So one question I can ask is who made it? And you know, when I first started tracking, I thought that's what tracking was. I thought it was just the who question. But once I've asked the who question, I can now ask, well, when was this track made? When was this animal actually here? The next question I could ask is, well, what was the animal actually doing when it made this track? You know, was it, how, how fast was it moving? Um, was it hunting? Was it being sneaky? Was it running away from something? Is it inside of its range? Is it outside of its home range? Is it comfortable? Is it mad? Is it just like normal? All of this information is actually written inside of the track. So what was the animal actually doing and what other information can I pull out of it? And then once I start to deduce, okay, well, the animal was walking and it stopped for a second and then it sped up. Well, I could leave it there or I could say, well, why did it stop? And why did it speed up? And are there signs of that? And can I piece that together and start to put the, the story together? And then from there, I can say, well, where did this animal come from? And my favorite one is, well, where is this animal now? And for those of you that watched a couple of weeks back when we had Alexis Burnett on as our guest for Living with the Seasons from Earth Tracks, Alexis shared that beautiful quote from one of his mentors. I think it was a Tom Brown quote, um, where he basically talked about, you know, when you find a single track, Think of it like a, a thread. And if you pick up that thread, there's actually a living being attached on the other end. And when I follow that trail, I'm connected to that being and everything it's done since it's left that track. 
Uh, and that's where the art of questioning kind of takes us and the kind of relationship that we can start to build with the land. So there's the who, when, what, why, and where, uh, along with anything else you can think of or that you get curious about. And tracking is a lot about following our curiosity. So let's, let's just break through a couple of basics right now. So when it comes to the who made the track, here are some things that you might want to consider. So we could look at the, the size of the actual foot of the animal would be relevant. Um, we can do something we call body sculpting, which means, okay, if I take like a track set and I, if I look at, let's say the outer width of the two tracks that I find are the trail and I can say, okay, well, the animal is probably roughly this wide. And then if I look at the length of a step, I can say, oh, well, based on the step, it's probably this long. And I can kind of sculpt a general shape with my hand and say, okay, I got an animal that's, you know, this wide and this longish. And when I look at the foot, I'm like, okay, that's helpful. Um, and then I can look at the length of the step. So I can look at the size of the animal. I can also look at the unique characteristics inside a given track. So how many toes does it have? And what you'll learn is that different animals have different toe configurations. Like for example, rodents are the only family that usually register four toes on their front and five on their back versus a dog that has four toes on both feet or uh, a weasel that has five toes on both feet, but the rodents are four and five. So the toe configuration is relevant. Uh, do the nails register? Right, cats have retractable claws. So they don't usually register their nails where dogs do. Uh, we can look at the gate. Now the gate refers to that actual pattern that I shared in that story about the deer. So what kind of pattern does it leave as it moves? That's relevant information. Uh, we can look at the leading edge of the track. We can look at the habitat that we're in. You know, if we're trying to tell, is this a Eastern cottontail or a snowshoe hare? Or is this a coyote or a wolf? Well, the habitat is gonna be really helpful for us in determining what species might even be in that area to begin with. And then we can look at behavior as well because different animals are prone to different types of behavior. And all of those things uh, contribute to the who the animal is. So let's do a, a quick little case study right now. Who is this? Um, and what? how can we apply some of those questions to it? So first off, I can say, the, and, and here's, I wanna share that this is super, super important. One of our downfalls as trackers, I'll just say, is that we'll get these ideas in our head and we go right to the answer. So when I say who this is, you'll just say, oh, I think it's a rabbit. I think it's this, I think it's that. And what I'd encourage you to do is to try and train your brain to not go right to the who, but actually look for multiple pieces of evidence that suggest a who, instead of just like a past remembering you have of what that looked like. So when I look at this, you know, some of the things I'd look at before I try and name it would be like, okay, well, how many toes are in the front foot? and how many are in the back. And maybe I don't even know which is the front and the back. But if you look at this track, you'll know the bottom ones. Uh, and if you look at the one in the bottom left, you'll notice there's only four toes, right? If you look at the top tracks, you'll notice there's five toes. So there's a piece of information. Well, four toes and five toes, that tells us that we're in the rodent family. So this animal might be a rodent. What other information could you have? Unfortunately, I didn't put anything in here to show you scale, but like the size would be relevant. Uh, one interesting one, if you look at the lower ones, do you notice how there's these little bumps or little bulbs that kind of protrude through? Again, the lower left track, you'll notice there's at least four little holes inside of the heel pad on top of the toes. Well, why might it have little bulbs on its foot? Oh, maybe it's because of grip. Maybe that suggests that this animal actually climbs trees. So without even knowing who this is, I can look at the shape of the foot and say, oh, I bet you this animal knows how to climb based on those little bulbs on there and it shows claws, and it has four toes on one foot and five on the other. And I start piecing all of these different pieces of information to support my hypothesis, my theory as to who it is. So five toes on larger track, four on smaller, shows claws, bulbs on the heel pad, different size between front and back, the gait is a bound. All of those things lead to me this being a red squirrel track. Um, but I have multiple different pieces leading me to that. I didn't just say, oh, it's a squirrel because it looks like a squirrel because of the way that it is. I actually used a scientific approach. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love teaching tracking to kids is it actually teaches a really good scientific and objective process uh, to, to learning about the world and reading information, which in this age of instant information on social media, I feel is so valuable for, for the human brain to train ourselves to actually be objective in our reasoning. Uh, and tracking is a great tool for that. Um, when it comes to the when question, when was this track made? Um, looking at things like uh, what are the biggest influences, the weather, the time, interference. Um, these are really important questions when it comes to the when. 
Um, what was the animal doing? I'm going to look at the gait of that animal, like the pattern that's left and reading that, like I shared in the opening story. Uh, why was the animal doing this? This is where there's a bit of an art. You know, I'm going to start looking at other tracks. I'm going to look at signs. I'm going to look at the habitat, the greater landscape. And then, of course, where did the animal come from? Where is it going? This is what we call the art of trailing when we actually learn to follow it. So there's just an example of using those five whys of questioning um, to start to, to deduce some theories and some answers as to what's going on. So I'm going to leave it there and pass it over to Christina, you right now. Um, yeah. And hey, Christina, I'll just throw a shout out. So we're nine o'clock right now. The hope is to go around, finish around 930. It's okay if we're a little bit over, uh, but we, we, I mean, just teach what you feel you need to. We may not get through everything tonight. And if we don't, that's fine. We'll just, we'll just pick it up next week with the rest of the group or in two weeks from now. So. Got it. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. So can you, yeah, you guys can hear me. I just saw the square shift. So I'm going to share my screen again. And uh, I'll need you to do a little bit of checking with me just to make sure you can see my whole screen because I know that was a problem just now. So, shift F5, shift F5, there we go. Okay, can you see this screen? Give me a thumbs up. Excellent. Can you see my cursor moving on this screen? Thumbs up, excellent. Are there any blank or obscured parts on this screen? Thumbs down, excellent. Okay, thank you so much for doing those checks with me. Um, Chris, just so you know, just now when you were sharing your screen, there was like this huge black line on the side and on the bottom. So I don't, I don't know what that's about, but just so you know, okay? So um, for the people who are in the Nature's Forgotten Language course, you'll know that you have a challenge this week, which is a scavenger hunt. And part of that challenge is to go out and to find um, some holes, some holes in places. So I thought just for fun, I'd throw up some pictures of holes that I've recently found and we can practice the art of questioning that Chris just went over so, so nicely. Um, just a quick note, it's really uh, important when you ask these questions to write them down. They can go on your phone, they can go on a little notebook you carry with you, but make sure you write them down because if you're anything like me, they go in this ear and then they go straight out the other. And if you don't, keep track of them, you won't have the opportunity to, well, you won't have, you'll have the opportunity, but you won't remember to follow through and research those answers. So just make sure you write those down, okay? So this is case study A, I'll show you case study B, and then I'll be putting these photos into the chat so you can check them out yourselves, and then we'll go into our great breakout rooms. So here's the hole that I found, just down here on the forest floor. This is a hardwood lot, it's about eight acres in size. So about, about a block, like maybe less than a block. And it's remnant of a mature hardwood forest. So there's oaks in there, there's maples in there, there's ash, there's hickory, and there's tons of deadfall. In fact, um, there's a fire station around the corner and I think they, they use this forest as practice for putting out fires because there's just so much dead wood on the ground. This hole on the bottom, it's about four inches in diameter. I, I put a ruler down and then I took it away for the photo. And the trail leading to the hole is going over this snow, almost to the bottom of this photo. Now I follow this trail and this is what it looks like, okay? So you can see it like kind of goes through this new fallen snow, a little bit of more new fallen snow fell in and then it just, well, it could have gone that way or it could have come this way. I'm not sure. I guess we're just going to have to ask questions about that. So my question for you is, whose hole is this? Okay, so this is case A. You could pick this one and ask some questions in the breakout room. And I'll share those photos shortly. So I'll leave this up here for a couple more moments. Okay, I'm switching slides. This is case B. Okay, the hole is here. You can see my ruler just measuring across it. It's in the same hardwood remnant. Uh, all these tangled things here, these are vines, they're wild grape. The exit from this hole is up and around on the left. So the top left hand corner, you can see it a little bit better in the second photo on the bottom. You can see all this snow has been trampled down. Right. 
So it goes to the top left hand corner. The diameter of this hole is about seven to eight inches, so a bit bigger. And the trail, I'll show you now, looks like this. It's just going right in between the space. Among these are sumac. These are staghorn sumac. Okay, so it's just, I'm not sure if it's going this way, coming this way, but it doesn't have new snow in its trail. So it left, well, I won't say too much. Okay, so this is case B. It's a bit of a bigger den. Uh, you can't see it here, but there's like a mound of dirt, a mound of dirt. In the other one, there was no mound of dirt. It was just dug straight into it on a diagonal, just like that. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this here for a moment and then we're going to be going into breakout rooms and I'm pretty sure Chris needs to set that up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put these photos into the chat and hopefully it'll work. And then in your breakout rooms, you can discuss this. Um, I'm not sure how long we're gonna take for the breakout room, but I'm sure Chris will pop in with that information shortly. And just practice asking some of those questions, those five W questions, you know, who, where, what, why, how is, has a W in it, so that counts. And then uh, we'll be taking this up later. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna share the files and I'm gonna hand this back to Chris. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna do some breakout rooms right now. So for those of you that haven't been with us when we've done this in the past, in a moment, you should see something pop up on your room and it's an invite to come and join uh, a breakout room. Uh, inside of that room, you'll be able to unmute yourself automatically. Uh, Christina, you, if you want to relook at the pictures, uh, grab that right now, because I don't know if you'll be able to see it once you're in the breakout room. So if you click on that, there's a link to Dropbox where you can actually grab those photos if you want to keep looking at them. And, and just to reiterate what Christina said in the breakout rooms, you know, you might not have any clue. So just practice the art of questioning with your group. Uh, the last thing that I do want to just mention is an invite as well. So we're going to have approximately kind of four or five people per room. Um, and I just invite you to make sure that you don't take up all the space. If you're someone that's got a lot of thoughts and a lot of sharing, by all means, please share. But make sure you, you leave some space for the quieter people in the group if they want to share as well. Um, so I'll just throw that invite in there. And I'll also share like, folks, just throw ideas out. You know, don't you don't have to feel any weirdness or shame about your level of knowledge. We have people on here that are very knowledgeable and very experienced. And we have people that are completely green. Uh, and you're all welcome. You're all allowed to be here. Uh, and you're all allowed to share your ideas. Let's all grow together. Um, and if you if you're like, I know this, like, I'm sure I do, like, I do this stuff all the time. Maybe instead of just giving your answer, maybe you could practice doing a bit of questioning with other people in the group to help lead them uh, down their tracking journey. So I'll just share those couple of pieces right now. So it'll be approximately four to five people per group. Watch for a thing on your screen um, to join. And if you don't want to participate, you can. Uh, we're going to take 10 minutes to do this. Uh, so we're going to come back at 9.20 and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Actually, let's say eight minutes. Um, so 9.18 and then we'll come back and, and kind of wrap up our call. Okay, breakout room should be open for the people watching the replay. Awesome, I hope that worked out well. Um, I just, I was trying to scan through. I still haven't figured with the large number of folks that we have coming on, it can be challenging to make sure that everybody has uh, interactive folks in the room and they're able to, to fully engage there. Uh, I try to monitor it and jump and move people around. So my apologies if you ended up, I think there was one or two rooms that maybe only had like two people in it but hopefully most of you had it in a good room and you had a good conversation there. Um, so with that said, oh, awesome. Nikki said two people. I, I saw your room there with only two people, Nikki. Uh, and I was trying to find some people. I, I actually sent a couple people over there, but I guess they never made it in. So glad you still had some fun with that and it worked out. Um, awesome. Okay, great. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Christina Yu right now. And she is going to teach a couple of patterns um, that folks can begin to go and start to look for out on the landscape. So over to you, Christina, you, why don't you take it away? And just, just for a, a time check folks, um, we're gonna, we'll, we'll probably be a couple minutes over, but I don't think we'll be too much. So we got about 10 to 15 minutes left in tonight's call. So over to you, Christina, you. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, thanks everyone. I hope you found that entertaining and fun. 
we'll be taking up the, uh, the answers in the second lesson in the second virtuals campfire. Uh, so in two weeks from now, um, in the meantime, between now and then, uh, make sure you sign up. Uh, and I just invite you to, if you had a really good question from your discussion, just stick it in the chat. Like just say case A, we were asking this, or case B, we were asking that, and just toss it in there. And so you can kind of give each other an example. So uh, like Chris said, he asked me to teach you a little bit of tracking patterns. So I'll be going over a couple that are usually confused with each other and maybe a little bit hard to distinguish. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen. Here we go. Share. Excellent. Shift F5. There. Oh. Yeah. All right. Can you see this? I see a thumbs up. OK, excellent. So um, what I'm showing you here is a drawing of a rabbit track on the left and a squirrel track on the right. Um, so this is the part where we kind of start asking uh, a couple of those questions that Chris was mentioning earlier, um, like how many toes, what's the shape, uh, which directions it, is it going in. So from here, you can see quite obviously uh, that the heel is at the bottom and it's fairly round. You see it's fairly round. Oh shoot, that's the wrong way. Um, here, the heel is fairly round, the heel's fairly round. And at the top, you can see the digits. So here, the digits are a little bit obscure, but you can see the claws. Same over here, they're going in a nice arc. You can see the claws at the top. And here, you can see the toes too. They're nice round little bulbs like this, round little bulbs with the nails on top. Um, if you look at the one on the left, you'll see that the toes aren't actually all that clear. And that has to do with the physiology of the shape of the foot, which I'll show you in a second. But here, the toes are super clear. You can, you can count each individual toe. So let's do that together. So over here, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five. Here, one, two, three, four. Five is down here. It's not too clear, but that is number five. So five and five is in the lagomorph group. That includes your hares and your um, rabbits. Four and five, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five. Those are your rodents, and those include your mice, your squirrels, um, what's a really good, your woodchucks. Those are also um, rodent family. And so that's kind of one of the ways we kind of sort the animals into which group they might be coming from. So next, I'm going to show you their feet. This is a rabbit foot on the left, and I believe this is a front. You can see that the entire bottom of the foot is covered in hair. And that's one of the reasons why you can't see the toes too well. It's because there's so much hair in the way. But you can see the claws, because the claws kind of poke through. With this squirrel, look at these awesome metatarsal and metacarpal pads. They just stick so far out. They're so different from the palm of our hand, which is so nice and flat. They've got these huge bulbs sticking out to like just cushion the, the bottom of their hand and their foot when it's hitting the ground. And they've got these amazing long, long nails sticking out. So you can see how if that was hitting the ground, it would leave a much clearer track showing the toes much more clearly than a rabbit track with all that hair in the way where you can't quite see the toes all that clearly. And again, these are, these are the hind feet. The front looks like this, but you can just see four, okay? So next. This is how they move. So, when they're doing that track pattern, which I'll show you in a second, their fronts land first, and then their hinds land second. Their fronts are a little bit narrower because their shoulders are narrower, and their hinds land a little wider because their butt and their hip is a little bit more flared out. The squirrel, when it lands, its front feet land side by side. You can see that in the bottom picture. And then what it does is it's an awesome handspring. It actually launches off its front feet and its hind feet then land in front of those two prints that its front feet left, okay? So it's two side by side and then two more a little bit wider in front of those two front feet, okay? So two fronts side by side, two hinds a little bit wider just past those fronts. The rabbit, its front feet are landing one in front of the other, okay? So one's a little bit lower and one's a little bit higher. You can see that in the photo where its front right is just a little bit behind its front left. Um, 
they're built for speed. And so they've adapted themselves so that when they, um, they're running, they actually turn their shoulders just a little bit on a diagonal so that their butt, their hind legs can come all the way in front past their shoulders and land on the ground. And you can see its hind leg is beginning to do that there. Okay, so its fronts would land one in front of the other and then its hinds would be a little bit farther out ahead. So one behind the other, not side by side, and then out ahead. Okay, so I'll show you what that track pattern is gonna look like. Here on the left is that rabbit that we were just talking about. And it's exactly what we saw in that picture, except that was on grass and this is snow. The right paw came forward, the right front paw came forward, then it left. And then its back legs came over its shoulders and made these two tracks at the top, okay? So one in front of the other, and then the two hinds a little bit farther out past the front. And if you look at the shape of the track, you can see that point, that point right at the top that we saw earlier, a couple of slides before in that illustration, okay? In fact, if you look carefully, you can actually see one, two, three, four, five toes. It's a little hard with this dusty, this dusty snow, plus there's all that fur, but you can kind of see an impression. It's not very clear. Now let's skip over to the right photo. This is also a track that was made in snow, but you can just see like the impressions are just so much clearer. You can count the toes. This is Chris's photo from earlier in the slideshow. In the two in the back side by side, you can see one, two, three, four toes. And in the hind foot, you can see one, two, three, four, and five. So two side by side for a squirrel, and then two a little bit farther out for the squirrel. Okay, so the front side by sides, the hinds a little wider and in front. Now, if you were to draw a line through these tracks, you could make a really cool pattern. So on the left, kind of makes this letter Y. The two come together and then there's a stem, right? Makes a letter Y and then straight down with two tracks, one on top of the other. The one on the right, if you draw a line through it, it makes a letter U. So it goes down through the hind, through both fronts, and then up to the other hind. And oh my goodness, we've just spelled my name. So there's a Y for a rabbit and a U for the squirrel. And now this is a simple mnemonic. I've come up to remember that. The Y is the Y in bunny. The U is the U in squirrel. So if you see this pattern, this Y, you know it's a bunny. If you see this U out in the nature, you'll know it's a squirrel. So awesome, virtual high fives. I and together they make that. up Christina U. Yes, welcome to the U universe. Anyway, uh, I will keep going. I hope you can just remember that. I'm very proud of myself for coming up with that. Sometimes um, it's a little bit hard to tell which animals making what track, especially in deep snow where you don't have that definition and you can't see the number of toes. So in those cases, it's useful to look where the trail is going. So I hope your contrast will allow you to see this, but there's a set of tracks that going from this tree up at the front, right at the top in the middle, right through the middle of this, the only snow we did not stomp down, down to the bottom. And it's just like a group of tracks, a group of tracks, a group of tracks, a group of tracks, quite even. And what it does on this side, there was actually another tree. So the tracks did went straight down from the one tree into the snow, all the way across this snowbank, and then right up into this other tree. There were no other squirrel tracks around. It was just from one tree straight to the other. So if we think about it, um, Rabbits can't climb trees as far as I know. I could be proven wrong, but squirrels can. And so if we see this pattern of maybe like, we're not sure if it's side by side or one in front of the other, and the two hinds are always side by side for both families, um, we can always look at where they're going and kind of use that process of elimination to figure out which species. This is a set of rabbit tracks and you'll see like, there's shrubs on either side and there's trees further back, but it actually weaves its way right between them. It's not going towards any of those trees. 
Now, sometimes they will go for cover because it's a prey species, but never will you see it stop at a tree and then disappear. The trail will never go to a tree and then just stop. It'll, it'll always be winding around. So if you see a set of tracks and you're not sure what pattern it's making, you haven't made a, can, you, ha you can't make a diagnosis, follow the trail as far as you can. And you might see a squirrel's gonna go up a tree pretty quickly. It doesn't like to stay on the ground very long, but a rabbit will stay on the ground all the time. And you can kind of figure it out that way, okay? So I hope that helps. Moving on. In the dog family, or more technically the canine family, there are a lot of, well, there's, there's three species, kind of arguably four that we have in Ontario. And sometimes it can be hard to tell them apart. Um, like Chris said, they all have four toes on the front foot and four toes on the hind foot. Um, but there are a couple of shapes and uh, little, little tricks that we can use to tell apart a wild canine from a domestic canine. And then of those uh, wild canines, you know, which is a fox, which is a coyote, and which is a wolf. So on this slide, you can see we've got coyote on the left, and we've got wolf and or domestic dog on the right. I'll just give a quick disclaimer. A lot of domestic dogs aren't the size of wolves. And so if you see really tiny paws, you know, or unusually large paws, you might be dealing with um, a breed of dog. Okay, so just keep that in mind. This is general. So we see four toes on this side, see four toes on that side, same number of toes. Look at the nails, okay? This is Chris's illustration, it's really good. The nails on the coyote are pointing straight and inward, okay? Straight and then inward. On the dog, uh, dog and the wolf, they're more pointing outward, okay? So they're kind of facing out instead of straight, they're all, outward, the angle is obtuse, okay? While they're symmetrical, that means if like, if you sliced it right down the middle, the right side would be the same as the left side. Um, not sure where I was going with that. If you draw a circle around them, you'll see that the coyote's track is actually much more oval. It's narrower than it is tall than a wolf and a domestic dog track. It's much, it's much rounder. And one more thing about the nails, I don't want to forget that. The nails here are quite sharp. They're quite sharp. If it's a wild canine and spending a lot of time on the dirt or in the snow, its nails are being worn down. So they're pretty tiny. Okay. Now I'm going to show you what their feet look like. This is a coyote foot on the left. It's from Michael Gold from the Animals Don't Cover Their Tracks Facebook group. That's an amazing group, by the way. If you're on Facebook, you should check it out. Um, and you can see that super oval shape. It's just a really tight foot, right? It's much taller than it is wide. So you can see why that would make an oval track. Its foot is oval. And if you look carefully, the nails come to quite sharp points. Like they've been worn down quite a bit. So that's those pointy nails. In this other photo, this is a wolf. Um, Toes are much farther apart. You can see more space between the toes, but you can also see that the tips of the toes, they're kind of flaring out a little bit. And that's part of why the nail orientation is wider instead of forward and inward. It's just, it's just a bigger foot. Um, with domestic dogs, they do the same thing, but with a, like, whereas with a wolf, it might have to do with um, proportion and just like the structure of the foot. With dogs, I find that, um, their foot is just not very strong. And so if I show you my four fingers, just squeeze together like that, make four toes. If my finger strength, if my hand is strong, I can hold those four fingers together really nicely and press them and they won't flare apart. But dogs, because they don't walk a lot and they don't spend all their lives outside, they, their muscles in their feet are, aren't as strong. They can't hold their toes together as well. And so they start to kind of, when they push against the surface, they kind of start to flare apart like that. And so, and they're also overweight. So their toes just spread apart a little bit farther, spread apart a little bit farther, okay? So if you're confused between coyote and a domestic dog, that's a, that's a hint. Okay, now I'm gonna show you what their tracks look like. This is a coyote on the left and a wolf on the right. You can see that oval shape, taller than it is wide. 
we can see on the bottom track on the left, these tiny, tiny, tiny nails. Like in the top track, they're not even registering. They're so short. But in the bottom, you can just barely see them. They're pointing very slightly inward. And these two are pointing just straight forward. They're not going out at all. While in the right photo, you can especially see on this larger track on the left that the nail's pointing outward. The nail would have been pointing outward, but it's kind of covered by the other track. Just the toe is going this way, the toe is going that way. And it's just, it's just rounder. If you were to draw a circle around it, it's just much rounder than the coyote track, which is like, it's even narrower than egg shaped. It's quite tall. So you've seen the track now you've seen, and you've seen their foot and you've seen what their track looks like on the ground, okay? Now, third feral dog, feral canine, red fox. Of course it wouldn't be easy. The hind foot of a red fox, they do that nail thing straight and in on their hind and on their front they do out and then a little bit less out. So they do both, uh, which is awesome. And I, no, I won't tell this story. Um, if you draw a circle around them, uh, they're actually more round than they are oval. Uh, and I don't think I drew a circle for this one. Um, so you can see how like it's kind of a couple of hints to tell it from a dog or maybe from a coyote, but it's, it's, it's pretty subtle differences. And especially because the front has those nails going everywhere and the hind has those nails going in, you could easily confuse them. So what you're usually taught to look for is a chevron. A chevron is a triangle with the bottom missing. Okay, and in each of these foxes, front and hind, a chevron will show up. In the front, it's a little bit more pointed. In the back, it's a little straighter. Um, but you'll see this mark in their tracks. Now, let me show you why. This is a fox track, a fox foot. It's utterly covered in fur. It's just like that um, Eastern cottontail foot. It's completely furry to like just make it really quiet and lift it up. Um, but right in the middle, these are the toe, the front toes here, and this is the heel pad here. There's just this gap where there's no fur. And that's, that's what makes the chevron. The hair keeps the rest of the toes away from whatever substrate it's walking in. And then that little gap in hair just allows just a tiny little bit of its palm pad or its metacarpal pad or metatarsal pad to drop through past all the fur and do a little stamp, do a little stamp, just like you're stamping the date. So I'll show you what the track looks like. Oh, yes. Thank you, Tamara Anderson. She's on the call tonight. It's her picture. So thank you, Tamara, for letting me use this picture. Awesome. So here's the red fox track on the left. And already in comparison to the coyote and the wolf, you can see it's so much less clear, right? The definition of the toes, you can see the toes, but the snow is like kind of going everywhere. And that's the effect of the fur. It's messed up the clearness of the track. And you can see tiny little claw marks over here. Over here, I can see tiny, no claw marks here. So not necessarily diagnostic, but there is a chevron straight across the back, just this line. And here too, this kind of boomerang right at the bottom that shows, okay, it's a red fox. None of the other wild canines have that. None of the other domestic canines have that. Just the red fox. So if you find a chevron, it's a fox. This photo on the right, domestic dog, you can see the spread of the toes, right? From a weak foot or possibly a little bit too much kibble. But the big, uh, the big flag for me of this being a domestic dog is the size of these nails. Like this dog really needs a manicure. Look at the size of these. Like they're, they're absolutely massive. They, it looks like the last emperor from China. It just like looks like it's gonna Freddy Krueger you in the face. So like someone cut this dog's nails, um, but that's obviously not a wild canine, doesn't spend a lot of time on the ground wearing those things down, okay? So that's, I think that's, oh no, one more slide. And FYI, Christina, we're, we're 10 minutes over, so we should, we should wrap. Oh crap, oh, I'm so sorry, okay. That's okay. Uh, last little thing. A wild canine, they're on a mission, but a domestic canine, it's just on a meander, okay? So a wild canine, they'll go in a straight line wherever, wherever they're headed. This is Grenadier Pond. 
these two coyotes were going side by side. They went from where I was standing and took that picture straight into those trees right in front. No deviation. On the right, even though this, um, this dog on the left, these dogs on the left are going um, fairly straight into the distance, you can see right next to it, there's human tracks. And every time the human hangs a left, the dogs hang a left. Every time the human hangs a right, the dogs hang a right. So it kind of shows that you know, maybe the, the dog is definitely being influenced by the human behavior. Is it wild? Probably not. Is it on a leash? Probably, yeah. Plus, Grenadier Pond, it's kind of a wild place. This is a schoolyard. Um, not that coyotes can't go into schoolyards, but, you know, maybe a little bit leaning more towards a domestic dog. All right. Uh, so sorry to take more time than, a, than I should have. There we go. We're done. Stop sharing. Now that was great, Christine. I didn't want to stop you there. That was that was quite a download there of information. So well, well done. Awesome crew. So uh, just a couple quick announcements to uh, to wrap us up for this evening here. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to take a little bit of a pause on the learning. Um, sorry, on the living with the seasons calls. But I am lining up a bunch more presenters. So watch your email. Uh, email from Chris at Chris Outdoors when I announce the uh, the new presenters coming up. Um, probably going to get started in March or April with a whole new line of uh, presenters. Um, if you would like to join our cohort, the um, the course formerly known as Reading Nature's Forgotten Language, soon to have a new name. Um, there, there's still some room in the class. It's filling up pretty quick. We're getting close, uh, but we, we could probably take a handful more students. Uh, so if you go to uh, www.naturesforgottenlanguage.com, and remember, if you enter the coupon code TRACKS, tracks you get 20% off the course. Uh, would love to have some of you in us. That's where Christina and myself are going to be focusing our effort over the, uh, the coming weeks and doing a deep dive. For those of you that are in the course already, um, make sure you get into the course and go watch the lesson one videos. Uh, there's a bunch more stuff in there and it'll set you up with your challenge for this week. And hopefully tonight's call will help you for us. Our next call is going to be on, um, two weeks from now on a Monday night. I'm just gonna check. Oh, March 1st. So our next call will be 8 PM on March 1st. For those of you that are in the nature's forgotten language course. Um, I want to give one more, uh, quick shout out. Somebody had messaged me and said, Hey, what's up with the, uh, the artwork behind you? I actually don't know the name of the artist that made this one right here. Um, this is just in the, the cooperative learning space I'm in, but I'm going to share a link in the, the chat right now. For any of you that are on Instagram, uh, my sister actually does very similar work. Um, Alicia Gilmore Woodart. So I'm going to give a quick shout out to my sis right now. Uh, she's been doing some beautiful, amazing work. So if you're on Instagram, follow Alicia Gilmore Woodart over there. Um, and other than that, I hope everybody really enjoyed their evening tonight. Um, I know we certainly did. Uh, I will be sending out the replay in the coming days. And if you would like to join the cohort where we're going to be diving deep into the tracking, um, the world of tracking, you can jump, come join us. And uh, we're going to be chatting about the answers to those on our next call. Um, so that'll be for the folks that are in the Reading Nature's Forgotten Language course or the force, course formerly known as. Uh, we'll, we'll take up those answers on March 1st when we all meet back together. Um, yeah, naturesforgottenlanguage.com, tracks for 20% off. And thank you, everybody. Be safe. Have fun. Get out there. Go tracking. Uh, hopefully, even if you're not joining us in the class, uh, we've given you lots to go out and explore. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, I'm going to say one last thing just to close us off here. I'm going to slow down a little bit, too. I'm talking really fast. So I need to do that sense meditation again. Um, uh, everyone do that. If you're still on us with us right now, just, just take a quick deep breath right now. What I'd like to share, you know, one of the reasons that I changed the name of the course or that we're going to change the name of the course as I shared is that um, I don't have some master key. There's not some secret. Now we have a skill set around teaching people and helping people get uh, results around this kind of stuff. Christina, you is a fabulous mentor. And, you know, I want to say with humility that I feel like I've, I've learned uh, over many, many years of doing this, how to mentor people, how to make people grow. So if you want to come join us in the course, uh, we can really help you uh, grow exponentially. But what I do want to share is that, you know, you don't need a course. Uh, the recipe is there. It's curiosity. It's questions. And really, nature is the ultimate teacher. Uh, and that's partly why we're changing the name of the course, because there's not some key to unlock nature's forgotten language. Uh, humans know how to do this. So go outside, be curious, ask questions, get together with friends. And for those of you that aren't joining us in the course, 
uh, you, you have the recipe. Uh, just get out there and start playing and, and connecting with folks. And, and, and all of this information is available to you from the natural world. Nature is the ultimate teacher for this stuff. Uh, and really, it just takes dirt time and getting out there. So that's how I'd like to, to close us down for tonight and uh, say thanks so much, man. It's been a real pleasure connecting with you all. Uh, I look forward to going deeper with our class. And I look forward to connecting those that aren't joining us in the class when we do the next free series, uh, which will be announced soon. Um, I don't know if you want to share anything there, Christina, but that's all I have to say for tonight. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. So nice to meet you all and see familiar faces. All right. We're going to hit pause.